So welcome to the chapter on uh, calcium signaling. Today's lecture will be given uh, as traditional by the person who uh, helped in preparing all these slides. Uh, that would be for this chapter, Akif Jamheran. Jamheran is uh, pursuing his MS thesis on this topic actually, uh, on calcium signaling uh, under my supervision. And uh, some of the stuff in this chapter is also uh, covered in his uh, paper in ICC 2013. Okay, so the floor is yours, Jan. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about calcium signaling and basics and modeling of calcium signaling and some, some uh, techniques to cover uh, differential equation solving today. First of all, what is calcium signaling? So the calcium level in some cells in nature rise uh, in response to some sort of stimuli in usually in nature. So this rise in the level of calcium concentration is called calcium signaling, is uh, causing the calcium signaling. The calcium signals, this reaction is propagated to adjacent cells via a number of molecules. Uh, these are called IP3 molecules. They are secondary messenger molecules which uh, propagates the signal from uh, the initiating cell to the other cells in the in the line. So the calcium level fluctuation indeed carries information uh, from cell to other cells, and uh, recipient cells actually uh, get some of the information and utilize it uh, according to their benefit in the nature. And the signaling, the calcium signaling term, is actually very very much valid because there is some information flow that is uh, propagated in, in the nature. So we have developed a some simulation, uh, some animatic sim simulation. It is not uh, conveying the actual calcium signaling uh, modelings, but it's a very nice uh, representation. So I'm going to show you a video of it right now. Let's start it here. As you can see, when the animation, when the agonist stimulation comes, from the left hand side to, to the first cell, there's some IP3 molecules. I mean, as you can see, these are IP3 molecules. IP3 molecules released in the first cell. This release actually triggers some calcium uh, uh, molecules to be released from endoplasmic reticulum in the cell. Each cell has some endoplasmic reticulum, you know that. And the calcium concentration rises in this first cell. And some of the IP3, as you can see, propagates to the second cell. This initiates a new wave of IP3 molecules to be released in the second cell. And then, again, the calcium level in the second cell rises due to endoplasmic reticulum being stimuli. So, actually, as you can see now in the first cell, there's a rise in the calcium. And now in the second cell, there's a rise in the calcium level. So this signal is propagating through the cell array. So this is a small animation, and you can play with it at this address. Uh, there are some other parameters we used, and you can just play and do whatever you wish with it. Gap junctions. Gap junctions are really important phenomena. They connect cells, basically, to, but this is what they do. Uh, this is the most basic and most major way of interaction between cells. They're found in most animal tissue cells. They're found in most plant cells. They allow water-soluble molecules to pass between cells. Actually, they sort of basically connect the cytoplasms of each cell. Their estimated size is about 1.5 nanometers. Uh, this, of course, imposes a limit on which type of molecules to be passed on these gap junctions. So larger molecules, like polysaccharides and nucleic, larger nucleic acids can't pass through these. But uh, smaller molecules like calcium ions or IP3 molecules, secondary messenger molecules, can pass through these gates. So this imposes what sort of uh, molecules can be used as non -networking in non-networking applications. So that is why we used this uh, calcium, calcium ions to be, and it's also that's why this is very pre prevalent in the, in the literature. So the permeability. The uh, rate of uh, allowance of uh, perm permeability in, uh, of these gap junctions are controllable by the cell. Cell uh, 
controls these usually via the concentration of calcium ions and this actually causes the pH to change and the, the variation of the pH. It's also useful in constructing nanoscale ne network applications as you can see. So if you tweak and adjust the uh, the level of permeability in a calcium in a gap junction, you can adjust how much the information propagates through these cells. Gap junctions are actually physical channels, so the cytoplasm of each cell is connected, and the channel itself is comprised of more a pore surrounded by hexamers of a protein called connexin. This connexin forms around the pores of both adjacent cells, and I'm going to show you a picture of it. So both cells and both cells, cell borders have these gap junction connections and they, have, they produce sort of a gate between these two cells. So as you can see here, this is the second cell and the uh, upper body is the first cell. You can see that each cell has its own connection, connections and when the both cells decide to open these connections, these channels are opened and the cytoplasms of these two cells actually are connected. There are more than 20 different types of connexin proteins that are found so far and they have uh, effects on physical properties on these channels in terms of permeability and selectivity of the channel. So we can select which type of molecules to be passed or not to pass from these gap junctions. This is, a, this is a very very good property in terms of network constructions. Network construction, if you want to build something very much specific to a field, the channels uh, constructed by gap junctions are dynamic in terms of contouring permeability and selectivity. So they can respond to many internal and external factors, such as, as I said, calcium level or pH levels. Uh, the primary purpose of gap junctions are propagation of calcium signaling in the nature. Calcium waves are induced and appear to signal information relevant to cell processes, such as you know, cell growth and that. Of course, there are some other mechanisms, like defense mechanisms, and I'm going to talk about those. The, there's a wave nature in the calcium signaling, and this is very much like the carrier wave of amplitude and frequency modulated signals in human engineered systems. And as you, will, as you would imagine, a calcium signal is and looks like this in nature. So this waveform actually propagates through this waveform actually propagates through one cell to another, so it can it can be used to convey information to the other cells. In terms of signal transaction, transduction, transduction uh, calcium signal appears to be widely used as a second level messaging system. This is uh, prevalent in the nature. A signal origin, originating from one signaling technique comes up to a cell and translated into a calcium signal for further, trans, uh, further propagation. The fact that calcium signal appears in the form of waves indicates that sophisticated encoding mechanisms can be used in the nature to convey complicated significant information and not just the binary on-off signal, of course. So uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we have in nature about calcium signaling. So almost all plant cells have calcium signaling. Most of animal cells have calcium signaling. They utilize it very much. In humans, this is uh, very interesting to me actually. and. In liver, in brain, not in neurons, but in astrocytes, some supporting glial cells, we have these, and, and heart cells, we have these calcium signaling. In heart cells, for example, it, uh, the calcium signaling uh, helps to regulate the heartbeats and gives, uh, gives your heart uh, to, to the ability to beat, actually, in an indirect way mostly, but it does. If no calcium waves were there, there wouldn't be any heartbeat. There wouldn't be any heartbeats. So this is one of uh, two very interesting examples I found in uh, literature. In legumes, legumes are baklagil in Turkish. Uh, calcium signaling is explicitly shown to conduct vital information. Uh, le in legumes, the information about root infection, some, uh, of course, root, root of the legumes can be infected by uh, some sort of uh, 
some type of a fungi and some sort of uh, bacteria. And the type of this infection is propagated via calcium signaling. Uh, the calcium signaling occurring uh, in both of these conditions is like this. For example, if the root infection is caused by myocorrhizal fungi, you, you see an inf uh, a calcium signaling pattern much like the, above, the, the pattern in A. It's much more chaotic, it's much more spiky, and it is hard to model actually. And if there is a bacterial infection caused, uh, the cause of infection is bacterial, uh, you see the type of uh, calcium signaling uh, much like in B. This is much more systematic, much more periodic, and much less chaotic. So, let's see. And of course, these signals are pretty much different to the eye, but what else is different? Upward and downward phases of these signals are different. In myocorrhizal fungi case, upward and downward phases are very short, and it's very obviously, uh, very closely, uh, very uh, similar to each other in terms of time. But in not factor case, as you can see, the upward phase is very much shorter than the downward phase. So we get this triangular shape uh, of a signal. And the last one shows you the Fourier analysis. As you can see, these two signals are very much different. Another example I like pretty much is this. It is actually found in many plant species. Uh, the openness of the uh, of the stoma cell is mostly determined by calcium signaling. So, as you can see, there is some sort of an amplitude modulation here. Uh, the, if there is no stimulus, the stoma is open. And if there is no calcium signal, here is again, the stoma is open. If there is a mild increase and a, a smaller amplitude calcium signaling, there is a partially closing stoma, we see. And if there is a full wave, we see a closed stoma. So there's an amplitude modulation going on here in nature, and there's a, a, a ample evidence for this. And we can use this kind of signaling for nano, nano networks and information conveying in nanoscale. So how do we model these signals? Of course, modeling is very much important because we don't have plants, we don't have uh, bacteria in our labs, so we can't really just go ahead and make some experiments with it, so we, we make our experiments on models. How do we model? So, we need complex mathematical models, and there are many, many different models in literature. So, what I choose to use in my studies actually were the Hoefer's models, because they are widely accepted, they model a nice, they have a nice model of propagation through different cells, and it actually is widely accepted in the biology literature, so we, we, we thought, why not, we, we would use this. Any questions, by the way, right now? So, okay, I'm going to continue. According to this model, we have, we have these two cells. Actually, this is the first cell and this is the second cell, and you can uh, think about this cell array goes on and on and on. Uh, the first action is beginning by the agonist acting on G-protein coupled receptors to stimulate some molecule, some protein called PLC beta. So when this PLC beta is stimulated, the level of PLC beta is increased in the first cell. When the PLC beta is stimulated and stimulated, okay, uh, PLC beta elevates the level of IP3 in the first cell. Thus, we have an elevated level of IP3 in the first cell, as you have seen in the animation before. Then, IP3 acts on the IP3 sensitive sensors on endoplasmic reticulum. Here you can see them. Here, endoplasmic reticulum and IP3 here acts on IP3R, which is the IP3 uh, sensitive sensors, sensitive molecule, I would say. And endoplasmic reticulum is stimulated. And then endoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium. How does the wave propagate? Some IP3 and calcium ions propagate through these channels, these are gap junctions, of course, to the second cell and stimuli uh, an, another protein called PSC gamma. 
in the second cell. So the rise of the level of PLC gamma in the second cell stimulates IP3 again, and IP3 is released again in the second cell, and the whole process restarts again in the second cell. So another calcium wave is produced in the second cell. So there's some uh, dreaded equations, I would say. Uh, these are some of the partial equations that are used to model model these calcium waves. As you can see, they're partial differential equations because they are dependent on both time and both uh, spatial domain. So for now, just ignore the spatial and just let's concentrate on the time uh, part and let's treat them as uh, ordinary differential equations. Here, C denotes the cytoplasmic calcium concentration and S denotes the sarcoplasmic calcium concentration. Of course, the derivative of C with respect to time uh, denotes the rate of change of calcium in the cytoplasm. And the derivative of S with respect to time denotes the derivative of change uh, in the sarcoplasm, in the calcium concentration of the sarcoplasm. When I go on, R uh, denotes the active fraction of IP3R molecules that are bound on the sarcoplasm. Remember there are uh, these reactor molecules on the sarcoplasm, so if there is no reactor molecules like IP3R, if, if the IP3R concentration is zero or active percentile of IP3R is zero, there is no reaction going to be present. And lastly, I is the concentration of IP3, and it's defined as this one. Any questions now? No? Uh, what was the sarcoplasm, by the way? Sarcoplasm is endoplasmic reticulum uh, correspondent of, uh, that is present in the astrocyte. So if a cell is an astrocyte, we call endoplasmic reticulum a sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's the same thing. Sarcoplasm is a fluid. No, it is the organelle, this one. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is the correspondent of endoplasmic reticulum. It's, it's acting as a calcium flow inside the cell. Mm -hmm. It stores a uh, lot of calcium in it. So once you trigger it with the IP3R, uh, the IP3 sensitive uh, receptor, uh, when the receptor is triggered, then the uh, calcium pool here, it's the cytoplasmic reticulum, it releases most of the calcium it has already stored. That's how actually the calcium uh, level increases by uh, factors of thousands, actually. Uh, in a very short duration. That's how you create actually the increase in the concentration of calcium. Then it will collect them back to the pool for the later impulses. Okay. So again, uh, VPIC beta, VPIC gamma, we dig. Uh, respectively denote the rates of PIC beta, PIC gamma, and IP3 degradation because these molecules degrade over time and according, uh, with respect to the other concentrations in the cell. We have to model all of these. And lastly, we release V cerca, V in, V out denote respectively uh, calcium release from the cerca, calcium pumping into the cerca. I want to grab your attention a little bit here. So as you can see here, we have the rate of change in uh, calcium, there, there's calcium concentration in cerca dependent on the amount of influx into the cerca minus amount of release from the cerca. And it's, it makes a lot of sense, right? So if you look at this and look at here, you can see that calcium concentration in the cell is very much dependent on what goes out of sarcoplasmic reticulum with a coefficient of beta because the volume of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is actually very much smaller than the general cytoplasm of the cell. In, term, in fact, it's like 20 times in the size, in the volume. So you have V cerca minus V rel here, you have V rel minus V cerca here. The, please notice the sign. And the last ones are V in and V out. These are the calcium influx and calcium extrusion uh, through the plasma membrane, through the outer, uh, outer membrane, and they're not very important actually. If you don't model these here, if you don't put these two here, 
there's not going to be much change, but in this model, this kind of influx is also modeled. So the main thing is going on here. So what is V relative and VPIC gamma? What are these equations? Hoffer models V relative as this. And I'm not sure what are the significance of this because it's, it dates back to 1978 and there are a lot of, a lot of uh, other models based on this and this is uh, a derivative model from those. And it is found and we have accepted it and it works in, for our purposes. So you have seen a lot of, you see you have seen a lot of coefficients as here, this k6, k1, k2, something at some other. These are the coefficients so far used in his model. I'm not sure if you can see them, but these coefficients are chosen for some sort of a best fit for, for, for a nature of phenomena. So they are not God given. You can tweak them and change them a little bit to fit your experimental data, to validate your experimental data, because we are trying to model some sort of a uh, naturally occurring phenomena, so we need to find the best and optimal parameters, actually. Actually, even uh, Hoefer made some, uh, some tentative decisions, especially here in gap junctional permeabilities, because we don't exactly know what is the gap junctional permeabilities of, of uh, these cells, and we can't exactly measure them. So what we do is to give uh, some numbers and try uh, of course within a range uh, to what could what kind of ranges of this value could produce what kind of results and compare it with ex experimental results that's what they do in the literature so if you choose here for example one as permeability of ip3 the if i have those slides yes okay i'll come back to that later so the spatial dynamics Remember, we have just forgot about those a little bit earlier, and now we've come back to those. So these equations are used to model uh, the gap junctional, perma, uh, gap junctional propagation of IP3 and calcium. So what is this? Okay, so as you can see, uh, actually you can uh, model any kind of diffusion through any border with this kind of an equation. But uh, it, is you, it is what Hoefer used in his model for uh, cell boundary propagation, diffusion from cell boundary. As you can see here, the calcium concentration in the one side of, of the cell, okay, let's, let me just show you it, show it to you a little bit here, if anyone can see. This would denote this epsilon minus point in the in the spatial domain and this point the, the next adjacent point would denote the epsilon plus point in the spatial domain so if you just uh, model this calcium concentration uh, according to these points and according to time in the partial differential equations you would get some sort of this this like some sort of a model like this and there is, luckily, a closed form solution to this model. But it is a diffusion topic, so I've skipped it for this class. And if, if you are very interested, I will show you afterwards, because it's kind of my work. And what are the results, and what could be interpreted out of these? So when you model these waves as such, as you've seen in these uh, differential equations, you would get something like this in the spatial domain. The range of the waves uh, mostly depend on the parameters we used, as you saw, uh, a lot of parameters we listed. So what happens here, in two seconds, we only have the, a single cell is affected by calcium signals. There's only elevation in calcium levels in a single cell, the first cell. So the calcium signal propagates in, 20, in 12 seconds, 22 seconds, 32 seconds and 42 and uh, 52. As you can see, since we have a uniform distribution of gap junctional permeabilities and any other parameters, we have a uniform distribution of uh, a calcium signaling and we have this ripple effect because this is a wave. 
Remember, we have the ripple effect. And secondly, this, these are the time courses of IP3 and calcium levels in cells 1 to 10. As you can see, 1 to 10 are uh, modeled here and labeled here, actually. Uh, so we have a higher co uh, rise of calcium in the first cell, a little bit lower than that in the second cell, in a next adjacent cell, a little bit lower than that in the third cell, and fourth cell, and so on. As you can see, what we have here is a diminishing calcium, calcium propagation. So this is, again, parameter dependent. If you want, if you want to, to model a non-diminishing uh, calcium signal, you can change the parameters a little bit, and you can just get a regenerative model out of this uh, equations and use it on your studies. So, but you can also model non-regenerative diminishing models with, with this model, with Hoefer's model. This is actually one of the interesting topics, I think. Uh, this is what Hoefer experiment also experimentally validates, and his model actually is able to uh, show us, give us this kind of results. In here, each cell has a different gap junctional permeability, and some cells don't have any permeability, they, it's just zero. So they've closed their gap junctions, you can, you can just think that. So what they have here, they uh, just ignite the flame and just start a calcium wave from the, from the middle cell, and the calcium waves propagate along these two directions, this way and this way, therefore they don't have this ripple effect, and they make it, uh, they make the information go to the specific cells they wanted. So this is basically a form of routing, as we know of, more of it. So if you just close some of the gap junctions here, you can prevent the information going from here and just cause the information go to these cells. This is what are we plan to work on. Uh, can I have one question at this point? Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the center node, mm -hmm. center cell, uh, you close the uh, gap junction, if I'm not wrong, to uh, left, mm -hmm. or let me say west and northwest. Is that right? I think this one is closed, this one, and this one is closed too. Okay. So this one is closed too, I think, if I'm not wrong. How about the cells a little bit more to the west and northwest? Is it like only the neighbors of the center cell have closed the gap junctions? No, they're or randomized actually. Most of them are randomized. randomized? And yes. Okay. So, but uh, they, are, have, they happen to be zero, these ones, I know. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking that question was, uh, even if uh, those immediate neighbors of the center cell have closed their gap junctions, not mm -hmm. to see the uh, calcium cell mm -hmm. uh, signal, mm -hmm. if the neighbors behind them if their uh, gap junctions left open, mm -hmm. is it possible that the uh, signal or the wave will just turn Pro around? Propagate like this? Yep. Yes, it's possible. It's possible if you have regenerative waves. It is very much less possible if you have diminishing waves. Okay. In this part, I'm going to talk about some numerical methods, some basic numerical methods, actually. Uh, so if a differential equation is not linear, is not separable or exact, it is very much unlikely that you will solve it by symbolic manipulations. So we employ numerical methods, some approximations, to find some kind of a solution, at least for differential equations. So if your differential equation is of the form uh, derivative of y divided by derivative of x equals to some f x and y, some function, we have, and we have this initial condition, of course, only initial condition problems can, we can do this. By uniqueness and existence theorem that I'm sure all of you know, uh, there exists a solution in an interval near x, e, x zero, because we have this initial condition, right? So, from this initial condition, we approximate uh, other solutions in the solution space. How do we do this? So imagine uh, there is a differential equation and its solution is something like this. So this is your differential equation's solution. And this is your initial condition, x0 and y0. So what you would get with tangent line method, what you would get with f that is presented by dy over dx, 
equals f f uh, we would say f of x and x and y uh, you would get when you evaluate this function a tangent line and if you propagate along this tangent line and select another point of x1 and evaluate this again with f you would get another tangent line and with x2 you would get another tangent line another tangent line another tangent line another tangent line and this builds up to an approximate solution to this uh, original solution, actually. And how uh, Euler's method works is like this. So what you would find here, as you can guess, you uh, preserve the old solution, y0, and you evaluate, this is some old slide, I don't know why. Uh, you evaluate this, this should have been x, by the way. You evaluate this uh, f of x and y with a small difference between x x n plus 1 minus x n. So x n plus 1 in the first case would be x1 minus x0, right? This is the first difference. So what we call this difference is in, in numerical methods, it is the step size function. Step size actually, not a function it is, but it's a constant step size mostly. So what you would get, uh, what you would do to evaluate uh, this y n plus 1 is to uh, just add yn plus the function times the step size. So it's rather easy. If you are trying to evaluate x1 and to find y1, y1, sorry, you would use y0 and f0 with uh, times h, right? Quite easy. And the uh, pseudocode for this Ehlers method is very much simple. As you can guess, these are some initializations and the main thing is occurring is in this for loop uh, we have a for loop from j to n it, it first evaluates uh, k1 that is f x and y f x and y could be any function like if dy dx is equal to x squared your f is x squared just simple so just take the x squared and uh, times h, you just uh, multiply it with h and add to the y and iterate over uh, n. So we get a lot of solutions in the solution space. But it is costly, of course. It is uh, computationally very costly. If n is very large, a thousand, a million, we, ha we have to make iterations all the way down to the millionth uh, element. And h is generally uh, less than 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So you have a lot of computations to do. So, but of course, as you can guess here in the tangential line method, there are some errors. So you go like this, right? In the tangential line method, but there is some error at each point. How do you would, how would you uh, modify the function over a function to reduce this error? Is the question. So uh, what they found is to give has some additional degree of freedom to this uh, function over there. And what they do is here, again, this should have been x. I'm sorry for it. When you, when you try to find y n plus 1, you add y n, uh, the f x n y n, the f plus x n plus 1, uh, comma, y n plus 1. This adds an additional uh, dimension to your solution thus actually produces much, much precise results. It's squared, it's, it's actually squares the error uh, compared to Euler's method. So, but this part is hard to evaluate. So what would we get out of that? This is Fn, it is simple. It is the same thing as Euler's method, as you can see. Here, F, Xn, Yn is Fn. This is the same same thing. Oop. So this propagates like that. And for f x n plus one, you approximate it again with f x uh, x n plus h, y n plus h times old f x. This should have been x f x n y n. I will uh, correct the slides before I post them. So this 
again, is the same thing as this, but this whole thing is also an approximation. So it, at each step, we do two approximations at the same time. And we divide it by two, since we need the arithmetic uh, mean. And what you get as, as the final solution is fn plus fxn h y uh, h fn, and divide that by two. Of course, times the step size. How would we calculate it? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just showing you the, this part, the calc label. And we, if we change it like this, uh, we just uh, compute k1 and then compute k2. k1 is actually this part. And for k2, we need to comp uh, do all of it, of course, because we need two steps at each iteration. And we compute k2. And then we just compute y from k1 and k2. And we just iterate x over h. We have uh, one more computation done per uh, you know, loop, but we have much higher precision. And my other third method is runge kutta approximation. And it's actually a very basic method also. It's what it does is it, give, it needs four uh, different uh, components to be calculated at each step, each iteration. And there is some weight of these components. So this is weighted 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, and this is 1. Of course, we divide it by 6, because we need the arithmetic mean again. But the third term is uh, given more uh, weight. And it is has historical significance. This method, I think, was found in 1975, but it is widely used still because it's very, very robust. Uh, what do you do for uh, calculating K1, Kn1? Is it's just Fn. Kn2 is Fxn plus one over two h, because. You just uh, you just take the half of the step size here, and y n plus one over h k n on this is f n, because uh, you take the k n plus one because we have already processed. This. You don't need to process f n anymore, right? And the third step uh, is dependent on n two k n two. You get f x n one over h. 1 over 2 h y n 1 over 2 h k n n 2 and it is this one. I'm not showing you the derivation of this because it's nasty a little bit, but it's, it's not necessary. If you're very interested, I can show you. And the fourth one is calculated like this: x n plus h y n plus h k n 1. So, at the end, the algorithm changes to this. You can just read it out loud. It's quite simple, actually. You just calculate it uh, one by one. So, but just notice this. Uh, these things are important. This is just a linear combination of solutions at four points to the equation. So we just make four computations at each iteration. Uh, we quadruple our computation time. But uh, we get approximately 200 times more accuracy from Euler's method in linear differential <coughs> equations. Yes? In the previous slides, this one? K3 was multiplied by 3. K3 is multiplied by 3. Which one? At the first line. Yes, K3. But in the second, it's multiplied by 2. Let's calculate. 1, 3. Yes, it should be 2. Yes, because we are dividing by 6. It should add up to 6. It's my bad, sorry. Thank you for noticing. So this one is the is this one is the correct one, I guess. Yes. So you can just implement this and get yourselves a simple differential equation solver, and you're going to do it. So the pinpoints are you should take h the step size as small as possible because it increases. Uh, the accuracy, but it also increases your required computation. Why is this true? Let me show you again with the tangential line method. 
one more time. So let's say we have a differential equation solution like this. This is our solution space. So if you just take a tangent here and take a large step size from x n to x n plus 1, this is the step size, remember. So if you just take this approximation here and try to find the tangent, it will go like this, right? And you will take another x n plus 2. This is your h. And what would you get is there. So, oh, what is your approximated solution then? It is something like this. So you have a higher margin of error. But what if you have very small h, very small step size? You have to have a tangent line here. Sorry, not like here. Here. You would have a tangent line. You would have a tangent line very small, very close to. You have a tangent line very close to it. So your error gets significantly smaller when you uh, take smaller step size. But what you get, what you lose here, with three points, you only cover this much. With three computations. But with three computations, you cover this much in here. You cover this much solution space. You find this much solution space. So there's a uh, trade-off between uh, accuracy and performance. So there are some methods to increase accuracy over performance, like uh, adjusting the step size uh, according, to, according to your differential equation. Perhaps I can show you that. It is not our, in our scope, but it's a general information. So if you have a uh, differential equation like this, for example, very uh, uh, curvy here, but it goes very straight at the end. So if you, uh, how would I say, if you just choose smaller step sizes here and longer step sizes here, you would get a very much high accuracy and you wouldn't lose many uh, computational power because you just need many tangents here since this is very curvy to represent these curves, but you don't need as many tangents because you can't make mistakes here basically, because this goes pretty much a straight line. So it depends practically on your differential equation solution. So some equations may converge to infinity at some point. You may not, if you have something like this, a direct line uh, going to infinity, you can't solve it with, differential, with uh, numerical methods. It is impossible, sadly. But you, you should hope that your differential equations don't have infinite solutions. Linear differential equation systems uh, can be solved uh, evaluating each occasion at each time step. Time step, and you will do it again it, as your homework. So if you have something like this, what you would do is, so what do you have here? dx over dt equals x minus 4y. I've solved it uh, for you using numerical manipulations, and this is the exact solution. But you need to do, what you need to do is uh, use Euler's, uh, Runge-Kotta, and exact solutions. And you, you should plot them to see what is the difference. And this is the h. This is the step size you should use for Euler's. And this is the step size you should use for Runge-Kotta. So you have these two differential equations, dy over dt equals minus x plus 4y. Yes, 4y. And what you would do here, first evaluate this, freeze x over this, then evaluate this using your function, your implemented function, Euler's or runge -Kutta, and then increase the step here, increase the step here. You should go like this and evaluate each of them one by one. Then you can solve some uh, uh, multiples of differential equations at the same time. So that's my lecture. Thank you. If you have any questions, I can take them right now. Okay. Uh, you have to evaluate each of the equations separately, but at each time uh, step, you have to evaluate them. You have to evaluate both of them uh, one by one. You should evaluate this one first, and don't increase the step si step time just yet. Evaluate this one, increase the step time, come back here, evaluate this one. Don't increase it. Evaluate this one. Just treat it as a sequential manner. Okay. Not not very hard. It's you could just uh, understand it by, you know, intuition.
basically. <laughs>